Welcome to Now Innovating, a research impact series at the University of Calgary. I'm your host, Julia McGregor. Are you curious about available funding opportunities for innovators at the University of Calgary? USEED is a group of early stage startup investment funds backed by philanthropic support. These funds accelerate UCalgary and community-based startup companies to advance problem-solving research, create jobs, and fuel the economy. USEED Energy is the fifth investment fund of the portfolio, focused on advancing energy innovations from leading Canadian research universities. The fund supports innovations in the areas of energy efficiency, carbon capture, utilization and storage, and renewables. This episode, I speak with Dr. George Shimazu, a professor of inorganic chemistry in the Faculty of Science. His research and expertise in metal organic frameworks for energy and environment led him to develop a carbon capture technology which has been licensed for industrial use. Hello, George, and welcome to Now Innovating. Nice to be here. Very happy to have you. Uh, I'm excited to learn more. Like I know you're an inorganic chemist and your lab's research focuses on metal organic frameworks. Can you tell us what these are and uh, how they can apply to clean energy solutions? Yeah, so uh, metal organic frameworks are a newer class of compounds with tiny little holes in them. Oh. So you could think about them um, as like a molecular scale sponge. And so like a sponge can be used to, to clean things up. The, the holes, which are on the scale of nanometers, uh, they can be designed to be selective for certain molecules. And so one of the molecules that they can be made selective for is carbon dioxide. So you can actually use them to remove uh, carbon dioxide from a, a, a CO2 stream, a post-combustion stream, and actually do, uh, in, in, and actually do uh, CO2 capture. Oh, amazing. I'm actually trying to picture a nanometer right now, and I'm like, I don't, I don't think I can. <laughs> yeah, so um, a millionth of a millimeter, yeah. so. Pretty yeah. tiny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Makes sense to capture the, the carbon dioxide. Uh, so uh, with this research area, so it's led you to develop the compound, the Calgary Framework 20, or CALF 20? Um, yes. So can you tell us more about this discovery and its impact in addressing carbon neutrality? Yeah, so I would say the, the field of metal organic frameworks, now there's, there's a lot of startup companies. There's a lot of potential benefits, but the field also had a couple catastrophic shortcomings mm -hmm. in that compounds weren't very stable and they weren't very easy to make. Mm -hmm. And so that was really limiting in terms of uh, really big picture uh, applications for this class of compounds. So this particular compound, and I should say, we, we start off, we're a chemistry lab, we'll make 100 milligrams of, and that's usually enough for, for most things we wanna do. Uh, but for carbon capture, you're gonna need uh, thousands of tons. So we've gone from like nano, like nanoparticles of what your compound can hold to like, now you need giant amounts of this to make it actually useful in practice. Yes, so uh, right now this compound is being made by BASF in one ton batches. Wow. And so uh, I think people always think, wow, one ton is, is really, it's, it's a lot. Uh, but at the same time, we started making uh, 100 milligrams and in, in our lab, we were making two and a half kilogram batches. So that's a scale up factor of 25,000 to go from two and a half kilograms to a ton is only a factor of 400. And so, you know, we had a, we had a startup company with uh, two PhD students and they developed a, a way of, of scaling this up. And it wasn't done with, uh, you know, big fancy, uh, you know, $100,000 reactors. We were actually making this in, in Home Depot buckets. Not like Breaking Bad, though. Not like no, <laughs> but not with the you know not with the intent of uh, thinking. Well, you know, we'll give it to BASF and they'll yeah. have a really big orange bucket um, <laughs> that they would they would just be able to. We we were de-risking it, mm -hmm. which I think is a really important word for a new technology. Just showing that look, we can actually do two and a half kilograms, and you know we don't need anything fancy. Yeah. yeah, right, going from like your little lab bench to your, your giant buckets. <laughs> so the other thing with the CAF-20 that is really, really special is um, in, in terms of CO2 capture, there's broadly two ways you can chemically bond to the carbon dioxide, which obviously it works really well, mm -hmm. and this is what the conventional technologies are based on. Um, you'll have a liquid that will uh, form a chemical bond to CO2. 
The, the problem with that is it's an awful lot of energy to regenerate it because you're, you're, you need to break a, an actual chemical bond. But also the, um, the, the reactive group will degrade and the compound will lose its functionality. So you have to keep replacing it. Oh, okay. And I think most of the, the, the bigger projects really have underestimated the cost of, and the environmental impact of, uh, of using those compounds. So with our compound, it's really just uh, a condensation. The CO2 just condenses in, in the pores. It lays down on the surface of the pores. And because the pore is just the size of a few CO2 molecules, it's just right for the CO2 to, to nest in there and get comfortable. So CAF20 has a very, very special pore size and shape that actually the CO2 will, will bond before water. So the CO2 will actually condense before water, but it, then it's also not chemically bonded, so it's actually really easy to release. To, uh, in terms of the, the magic checklist of everything you'd like for a CO2 absorbent, this compound is uh, very easy to make. You can make it in huge amounts, and it has this very special ability to condense CO2 before water. But then on top of that, it's also uh, super stable, much more stable than most of the compounds in this area. I can't believe that that's so groundbreaking in the field. And the, sorry, how long, how long were you working on this before you, you know you, you actually developed the CAF-20? Uh, we were working, it was probably about four or five years. Okay. And then once we got the, the CAF-20, CAF-20 is also really interesting in, a, in the academic sense because it kind of, it challenges a lot of the thinking in the area because it has very good CO2 absorption properties, mm -hmm. but they're not, benchmark. There are other compounds that take up more CO2. There are other compounds that are more selective for CO2. Yeah. But a lot of those compounds will also have a, a catastrophic shortcoming um, that might require, say, for example, well, we can clean up the flue gas as long as all the water is removed. Mm -hmm. And then that just makes everything too expensive. So it, uh, it really is uh, emphasizing that you need to consider the whole, the whole picture like, you know, you talked a bit about working Savante and you've, you've shown the real world impacts with that. But can you tell us more about like speaking to finding the right partners for your research? So, you know, you're, you know, if you're going from the lab and you're like, okay, now how can I actually uh, demonstrate this in practice? Like, right. the partnership is so important. Yeah, so I, I think um, you absolutely need to put yourself out there, so to speak. <laughs> And you know, go to go to uh, events where you have a chance to meet uh, industrial partners. I was at a, an event where Svante had presented, and you know, we we work on making carbon dioxide sorbents, but we don't bring a carbon dioxide capture solution. You know, if you meet someone who, who works for a company and their job description is uh, greenhouse gas mitigations manager, if I say, oh, I've got a I've got a solution for you, they they think I'm going to bring what's on the skid that will be wheeled up to their facility, and that I'm also bringing potentially a pipeline to take away the CO2 that's captured. And I'm thinking, well, we've got a few grams of this compound that has really good CO2 properties. So it was good to, to meet them. And then when we, I met, I met them before we even had CAF 20. Mm -hmm. So when I had CAF 20, I actually paid for a trip to Vancouver for myself and went and uh, I'd phoned them and I'd arranged for a meeting. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, they, they were looking at a bunch of different things, but it was probably a good couple years before uh, they, they realized this is really something, something special for them. And what we, we hadn't done at that point, we had the CO2 data, we knew it was water stable. We didn't have the data that showed that uh, the CO2 could be condensed before water. And that really, uh, really changed things for them. That matchmaking service almost needed. Yeah. Um, there is a newer team actually at the university. There's an industry engagement team. I think that's uh, been formed within the last like year. So I think that there's other researchers, you know, now who are like unable to do that, like getting out there and finding the right partner. There might, you know, facilitating, you know, in inquiries for uh, for these kind of applications, right? Like like who can actually demonstrate these research things and their things. So yeah, well, and I I think it's it's very important to uh, to meet the right person at a company. And so I think uh, sometimes I'll talk to younger professors who might get discouraged about, oh, you know, they talked with someone from this company and they didn't seem interested. Mm -hmm. But depending on, you know, which 
so even in say the carbon capture space, is this person's job to uh, bring, what's the horizon for, their, for them to find a solution? Yeah. Are they looking five years down the road or are they looking 20 years down the road? Um, you know, what is their, their metric of job success for the projects that they're working on? So I think more and more, at least in the carbon dioxide space, there are a lot more options uh, for people who will help you in that technology readiness level four to seven range. Mm -hmm. you know, so for us, for example, we need um, even to go from uh, 100 milligrams to two, one to five kilogram size experiments, you know, that we, we don't have that equipment and we don't need it. Mm -hmm. um, we just need access to it. So more and more there's facilities like that coming that could be shared um, nationally or even internationally, just when people have something, the, the one magic compound that really merits really, really hard testing, um, that's, it's nice that there's more facilities like that. You, you know, Savante is using CAF-20. You were mentioning another, uh, was it Chevron you said that was using another application of your technologies? Like Chevron is the demonstration Demonstr site for, for the CAF-20. Gotcha. So there's like, so that's, so it's being used in two places currently. So like what, what's next for you? Like what are, what are you working on now? Or is it, are you still going back to CAF-20? There are other carbon dioxide opportunities for this compound. Um, having said that, the, the carbon dioxide separation space, it's really when, when people say curing cancer, well, cancer isn't one disease. Um, every carbon dioxide capture scenario is very different depending on what you need to capture this, separate the CO2 from and the concentration of it. So we, we've actually got uh, quite a bit more industry engagement uh, to develop new sorbents really from, from the discovery stage. So for me, this is, this is absolutely awesome because this is exactly the most fundamental research we would be doing. But to have um, industry partners appreciate that, but then who also appreciate that um, the, the challenge of implementing it. They, they can bring some of the engineering know-how to, uh, to best make use of the material. It was a scaling up approach. <laughs> yeah, sure. and it's, 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 really, uh, it's really exciting. You know, I think some of the most uh, rewarding conversations I've had with uh, industry partners have been in the last 18 months. Just saying, you know, basically to hear to hear them say, "Well, we trust your judgment on this." Uh, so your it's your technology. Calf Twenty has been licensed, correct? Like that. Yes. So um, with the licensing process, I think I think a lot of people, you know, who are innovators or moving their research forward, like I think that space is a little scary sometimes. Like not really, like sure what that means. Like what has been the biggest learning for you uh, with the licensing? Yeah. So I think um, when you make a new compound and. It's it's a, in a way it's like a it's like having an infant, and you, you want the infant to have every opportunity that can be available, but at the same time you you want partners that can bring bring something and help nurture nurture that development, and you have to really appreciate what what they bring as well. So I would say one of the, first of all an important point is really have a, a sense of of what you've got. And it's, in this space, it's kind of hard because you actually need some of the bigger tests to really know if you've got something really, really special or not. Um, I think in that regard, then, I think uh, a lot of times you can have people who are willing to engage with you and they may have money to, to provide, to, to sponsor some of your work, but can they really help you develop it? You know, if the next stage of development is uh, a million dollar project, you know, someone giving you $20,000 um, and then bringing constraints with that is, is actually not necessarily helping yeah. move things forward. So I think, um, and you know, people will be very uh, thoughtful about, a professor will be very thoughtful about it, taking a new PhD student because think, well, I might be working with this person for four or five years and you know, are they, are they motivated? Are they keen? Are they what I'm, I'm looking for? But uh, a partner for a licensee, you could be a partner with them for, for decades, right? So I think it's, it's, really, um, it's, it's really good to have uh, teams with people that you, you want to work with and that there's a real um, common sense of values and trust. Yeah. That's 
that's wonderful. Thank you that, for sharing that. That's uh, an amazing advice for people. Um, I want to go to mentorship, uh, ask you about that, because I think I think that plays a large role in your lab. You know, you have a lot of students. Um, CAF 20, you developed with, were they their PhD students as well that you worked with for? They, they actually, the two students initially started as undergraduate oh. students in the lab, then they did PhDs. They both went away and did postdocs, and then they came back and formed the startup company. Well, there you go. So there, so mentorship there, huge role. I can see that's a great demonstrator with CAF 20. Uh, how do you encourage innovative ideas uh, with your students, you know, who might have entrepreneurial ambitions with their, res with their research? Yes, yeah, so I think having uh, the engagements with the, the partners helps. And it, it isn't like you need to go and say, look, we've got this, you know, please use it. Um, some of these uh, conversations will, will, will occur over years where you're just aware of uh, some of the, the issues a, a partner may have, mm -hmm. a potential partner may have. Or some of the, uh, or also just the capabilities that they have, um, and so then just m meeting them and seeing things from the the end user perspective, um, that there are some experiments that maybe aren't typically done uh, for an academic publication, but are really critical for de-risking it and showing the potential of your work for a partner. Um, those kinds of of conversations, and I think. Even just having that that understanding, that first conversation, where it's like, well, this is something. Maybe this is potentially useful for you. You know, do we need an NDA for you to even mm -hmm. share specifics of some of the problems you have? You know, maybe maybe we can help. Versus, you know, I've I've got the solution. And now I say that because I think if I went back 15 years, I was probably oh, I've got the solution. <laughs> so that that's been a, a learning, and I think. Um, I, I think it's important in that regard to be to be in my position to be very modest because we aren't we aren't bringing a solution we're bringing a component that needs partners and you know I think it's the same as the the last question that was asked right they're also looking at me as a potential partner and am I someone they're going to want to work with mm -hmm. and you know can they can they trust that you know my I have I understand their goals and what their success metrics are because it, you know, for them, it isn't probably you know we got a paper and a good journal. <laughs> so, well, I think you're lovely from this interview. So I can probably, from a personal standpoint, say you'd be great to work with <laughs> as, as a partner. Well, and and well, thank you. <laughs> the uh, you know, and I think that once students see someone else doing that, I think it, it really just opens the door. It, so you know, right now, two of the PhD students in the group are contemplating um, new startup companies. And uh, it's, it's very, it's fun. It's really rewarding to see, um, there's, it's a level of excitement. Um, and, you know, when you talk to your, your friends and relatives and it's like, there's really a chance of us uh, translating this. And especially in a space that, that is important, that there is a, a genuine societal benefit. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, they're not motivated by by making money, although ultimately you you know you have to be making money or else you shouldn't be, you wouldn't be, <laughs> you wouldn't continue be able to continue if you weren't making money. But at the same time, that I, I don't think that's their main motivation. I think it's it's an awesome learning experience, and they genuinely feel they've they've made something that can help address a problem, um, and it it would be just unsatisfying to leave it. Uh, sitting in a library somewhere and hope someone else did something with it. Oh, definitely. So. Like, finish your PhD, got a company, got a really cool application. Like, yeah, I, I completely agree. <laughs> that sounds much more rewarding. Uh, so my, my final question, so, you know, George, you've told us so much, like, you're a chemist, you have patents, you've licensed technologies, you've, you've, had, you've started a startup company. Uh, I would just like to ask you about taking a risk and what advice would you give to, you know, other researchers out there who might have a fear of failure about, you know, taking that next step with their research. Yeah, I, I think um, knowing your risk tolerance is such a, a huge element of being a good researcher. And uh, one, one conversation I had, I don't remember, with it was just a visiting speaker when I was a PhD student, but a, a line that really stuck with me was, um, he said, if a tenured professor takes no risk in their research, then nobody will. And so I think as a, certainly as a tenured academic, we have freedom to address problems and we have freedom to address them in ways that uh, don't necessarily have to be profitable 
within a, within a few years, and we can we can justify that based on that the students working on it are learning uh, learning an awful lot, and so I I don't know in terms of risk and creativity, I I don't know if you can teach someone to be creative or teach them to to take a risk, mm-hmm. but I I do think you can stifle that in people, so I think just. Uh, once people have seen something done once, it, it's, it's much less risky. Younger people have a higher risk tolerance. Mm-hmm. The PhD students, they will still be getting their degree. They can still try something risky. Yeah. And you know, a lot of times they don't have the, uh, the commitments that someone a little older might have. They might not have a family or a mortgage staring at them. So they, they're, they're a lot more adventurous. Mm-hmm. I, I just really want to thank you so much, uh, George, for joining me today on Now Innovating and sharing your story. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for having me on. This was a lot of fun. You can learn more about the UCED Investment Funds, including UCED Energy, by visiting ucalgary.ca slash UCED. To learn how to move your research to impact in the innovation at UCalgary ecosystem, visit ucalgary.ca slash innovation. Mm-hmm.